you get to the place where you think you deserve something, that's when you're in trouble. Uh, we deserve hell, uh, but because of his grace and goodness, we are who we are through his shed grace and love. Amen? And uh, so don't forget Brother Dwight Mabry. I failed to mention that. I've talked to him a couple times this week. Dwight's not doing good. Uh, so, you know, he has a lot of problems due to the stroke and he, rehab never has been very successful, but he's having some other issues now and um, this breaks my heart. Uh, but anyhow, I, I know he wants to preach so bad and he's given all of his life to the gospel, serving churches faithfully and uh, now he's just at a place he can't hardly function and do anything and uh, it's very hard on him, I know. So pray for him, if you will, in your prayer time. He does need our prayers. Uh, I, my heart goes out to him, and I struggle with him and for him. As, uh, just a good, good friend, all of us, and great man of God, and uh, he's been faithful through the years. And uh, so, lift one up for him, if you will, when you pray. Amen. Amen. I got a word on your heart tonight. I just feel like somebody needs to brag on the Lord. Uh, sitting on the way here, I said somebody just needs to brag on Jesus tonight. And uh, but anyhow, anybody just want to honor the Lord tonight uh, with a word? What He's doing in your life, Miss Brenda. And there's nothing like knowing folks are praying for you. And you can feel it. Uh, I promise you, you, you know that you're surrounded with a wall of prayer. And uh, it makes it all the difference in the world when you know you've got a church family that loves you. And they're lifting you up. I promise you. Anybody else? We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark tonight, chapter 10. So we journey through that book. Can you throw me that water right there? I forgot to bring it, please. Thank you. My mouth still gets dry. We've been studying through this book. And on Wednesday night, uh, we entered that 10th chapter somewhat, and we saw uh, sort of, uh, again, James and John and uh, their mother requesting that they sit on the right and the left. And we learned a little bit about what Jesus was uh, saying about being that of a um, a servant or a minister and we talked about servanthood and the very fact that Jesus came in verse 45 not to be ministered unto but to minister and give his life a ransom for many and he really said one of the greatest things that we can do and the person that wants to be great in ministry is to be a minister to be a servant and the picture there really is where we get our term deacon from uh, which means quick to respond or, or through the dust Okay, uh, and then we journey here again, uh, and on Jesus' final journey, we're looking at the last week of his life, uh, and Jack sort of went there this morning with Zacchaeus, and we'll dip there for just a moment, but verse 46 says, And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt that thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Uh, as we read that scripture, our, our, uh, Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem has been pictured here. Uh, he went through Jericho. As you thought and think about Jericho for just a moment, uh, Jericho literally means to smell. Uh, it was given the name because of the rose gardens, uh, the balsam and the cypress and the other bushes that gave strong fragrance uh, through the countryside uh, there uh, in Jer Jer Jericho. Uh, if you remember, as we talked this morning, Matthew chapter 19, uh, Jesus encountered a man there, uh, a rich man, uh, by the name of Zacchaeus. He climbed up in that sycamore tree uh, and trying to discover uh, who Jesus was and then he began to follow him. And Matthew's gospel mentions the fact that there were actually two men on the wall that day uh, other than this, this man. There were two men on that wall as Jesus was leaving Jericho. Uh, and 
as we understand, many times uh, the blind and the lame would be placed in high traffic areas. Uh, so traffickers making their way through uh, would possibly give them an alm. Uh, they would help them and give them more or less a charitable gift as they lay there begging. Now, Bartimaeus in the Scripture pictures the condition of people outside a relationship with Jesus. Just like Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus was rich, but yet he had taken advantage of people. But really, spiritually, he was poor as a beggar because he had no relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't help but to believe as you read the, that Levi or Matthew probably uh, had maybe witnessed to him or whatever the case may be. Or maybe he heard about Jesus on this first trip through Jericho uh, when, he, when Zacchaeus had this experience. He had either heard about Jesus or uh, through Matthew or Levi uh, because they were both tax collectors. One said to, Matthew said at the receipt of custom on the shipping port and evidently he had had some impact somewhere in his life. But the bottom line is, as we look at this highway beggar, uh, we see uh, the second trip of Jesus coming back through Jericho once again. Well, first of all, I want you to notice the condition of this man. And many times Jesus uses these individuals to show us a portrait of who we are and what we're like and our status and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, notice a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. This highway beggar. Let's look at the condition of this man first of all. I want you to verse 46 tells us that he was blind. He was blind. In other words, uh, as you think about the scriptures tonight, uh, every one of us without a relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ, we're born blind without God. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. Paul said, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them which believe not. You don't know why people do the things they do and live the way they live? Because they've been blinded. Listen, they're blind. Their minds have been blinded to the truth of the gospel. Their blinds have been blinded. Uh, their minds have been blinded. Their spiritual eyes have been blinded by the God of this world. He said, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan's goal is to keep the, the illumination of God, of Jesus Christ, and the good news of the gospel from piercing their heart and changing their lives. And that's why we need to pray uh, for the blindness of our generation. We live in a time where we've never seen a blindness like we've seen toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most folks can't even tell you what Easter means anymore. Most folks have no idea of the basic doctrines of the Bible today. And this next generation coming through they have no clue of anything about the gospel. They just think everybody's going to heaven. They think if you're good enough, everything's going to work out. You make it the best way you can. We've got all types of ideologies, all types of doctrines and beliefs today. Folks, this is what we have to base the foundational belief system that we have off of the Word of God. Truth. He was blind. And he pictures you and I. Without Jesus Christ, He pictures you and I, He pictures the world today who needs the gospel to shine under their hearts and lives and illuminate their minds that they might see Jesus. Ephesians 4.18 says, Having understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Folks, our world, Bartimaeus represents those who are sitting by the roadside, they're highway beggars, and they're blind to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he was not only blind, but he was a beggar. <laughs> Verse 46 tells us that he sat by the highway side doing what? He was begging. Folks, do you realize tonight, I think he represents so many tonight. Many uh, today are, are in the moral poorhouse because of spiritual bankruptcy. Dr. John Phillips, that great British author, said, uh, to be lost means to be spiritually sightless and spiritually penniless. How true that is. There's a lot of folks tonight that we know around us, that we rub shoulders with, that are in our families, in our homes, our neighborhoods. I, just to give you an example, I, coming home from church today, I begin to think about the homes, and we've tried to share the gospel and witness and, and try to minister to folks on our neighborhood block. I, I look over here, and this guy's mowing. This evening before I left, my neighbor beside me was mowing. No respect whatsoever for the, for the day of God. I, I look around me today, and I, I watch all these people. None of them are in church. Maybe one out of, out of about seven or eight neighbors. Uh, none of them have no regard for the things of God. 
So you figure one out of eight houses right there on that one little block, we're actually the only ones who, who attend church and try to serve the Lord uh, for the most part. Most of them are unchurched, have no regard toward the things of God. That's the culture we live in. I thought about these kids standing up here. If you go back and you look at the stories in the Bible, uh, and, you, and I thought about the, the lepers that went out. There were ten children standing here. And if you want the odds of how many will stay in church out of that ten, uh, the sad to say only one out of those ten will be in the house of God when they get older. You know why? I believe tonight that we've come to the place where we're in a place of spiritual bankruptcy across our land. We need to understand that we're beggars we're beggars without the Lord Jesus Christ and we can't make it through life without His grace and goodness upon our lives. He was blind and He was a beggar. That's the condition of this man and He illustrates for you and I. Folks, we need, we need to remember tonight as I use those illustrations, we need to remember that sharing the gospel is one beggar telling another, listen, is one beggar telling another, another beggar where to find bread. Amen? That's all we are. We're beggars. We're beggars who found bread trying to tell others where to find bread. Look at the cry of this man, verse 47, verse 48. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 48. And many charged him he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Notice twice he pleaded for mercy. Uh, the cry that here's a man who once begged for money, but now he's begging for mercy. Isn't it amazing how things can change in your life? He realized his, his greatest need laying there on that highway beside that gate, wherever it was, he was dropped off every day. He realized his greatest need wasn't money. It was the mercy of God. And folks, our world today uh, thinks that their greatest need today is popularity and prestige. It's economic resources. It's, it's money. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not. <laughs> our greatest need of our world today is the mercy of God. It, no, first of all, I want you to listen to verse 47, this cry. It was insistent. It was insistent. Notice he, how he addressed Jesus. He began to cry out and say, Jesus. Now remember, there's a crowd here. Uh, it wasn't Jesus. He, he, he heralded what he said. The action of the tents here says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's in a place of, he's in a place of insistence. He addressed Jesus, though, very interestingly. Notice how he addressed him. He addressed him by his royal name. Son of David. A very unique name. You see, he cried out for mercy. He didn't come demanding his rights. He knew what he needed was more than he deserved. He, he not only needed phys he was physically blind, but he knew, ladies and gentlemen, he was spiritually blind. Keep that in mind. He cried out for mercy. He didn't demand his rights like our world does today. He realized he was helpless. He realized he was hopeless. He knew, once again, he needed more than he deserved. And folks, can I say, I can go back to the time when I got saved. I knew that I needed more than what I was getting out of life. I knew that I needed more than what I deserved. I deserved hell and I needed mercy and I needed grace. Amen. And I've never forgotten that. He was insistent. Folks, we don't, listen, we don't come demanding His justice, but we come demanding His mercy. And that's what He did. You see, <laughs> this man with a life of ruins needed some royalty. Amen. And he was about to get it. Remember Psalm 51 verse 1. Remember what David said. David said, Have mercy on me, O God. According to thy love and kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, he said, Blot out my transgressions. Well, you, he said, Lord, knowing what I deserve, and I know what I deserve, you know what I deserve, but because of your goodness, and because, have mercy on me, and because of your love and kindness, because you're so tender-hearted uh, toward your people, toward those who are in repentance, he said, will you wipe my slate clean? Will you blot out my transgressions? Ephesians 2, 4. I love what Paul said. He said, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Aren't you glad for that tonight? He loved us despite who we were and extended mercy. Listen to Titus 3, 5. Titus said, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Folks, it's nothing about us. It's all about Him. Amen? Uh, it's about Him. It's not what we've done. It's not what we've achieved. Listen, it's not about the dollar in our pocket. Lord, it's, it's about the divine nature that's been born again in our heart. First of all, it was insistent, the cry of this man in verse 47. But look at verse 48. 
it was persistent. Watch what happens. And notice what happened. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. I wonder what they said. They said, why are you bothering him? You're just, you're, you're, you're just a, a beggar. Uh, you're just a beggar. You've laid here for days. You've laid here for years. And why is he going to waste his time on you? And they charged him that he should be, just told him to be quiet. Why don't you hush? But notice what happens, verse 48. I think we see his desperation. The Bible says, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, once again, have mercy on me. It was persistent. You see, despite the critics, he continued to cry out to Jesus. You see, folks, you know what he realized? He realized his condition was a big deal, amen? He realized his condition was a big deal. And let me just say tonight, it's still a big deal that people are lost without Jesus. It's still a big deal that there are people on the highway side of salvation begging for the gospel. There's people tonight that are lost. And it's a big deal that they're going to hell. It's a big deal. It's a big deal that, just listen, that folk today don't seem to want to go to church. It's a big deal today when we think about those today that are separated from God. And they're looking for something. They don't know what they're looking for. They need the mercy of God. And they can't seem to understand it. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility uh, to show the excitement, enthusiasm, and the encouragement of a relationship and a fellowship with Jesus Christ that will cause them to wonder what's missing in their lives so that they can get off the highway side and get on the right side and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Despite his critics, he continued to cry out to Jesus. And let me just say, let me flip that around. Despite the critics, you and I are going to have to still cry out that Jesus is the only way to salvation. We're going to have to cry out. We're going to have to be insistent. We're going to have to be persistent in our lives so that folks will know that there is a God that's real. They're going to have to know that there is a big deal of serving Jesus Christ. It is a big deal that God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world to reach down and save our souls. We who are on the highway side begging for something different in life. You see, the devil will do all he can to stifle your cry for mercy. You can't let him. And there's folks that you know tonight that need the mercy of God. They need God's mercy. Don't let him hinder you crying out for them as well. By the way, let me just say, there'll be the crowds that you face as well. As they charge him to hold his peace, he cried the more a great deal. And folks, as the crowd around us gets louder and louder tonight against, uh, with paganism and all the criticisms of Christ and the church and, and all those other things, we got to raise our voices even louder what God can do in and through one person's heart and life that will be yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the crowd's a life you to scorn if you let them, but we can't do that. Well, let's look at the command of the Master Lysley in verse 49 through verse 52. Notice something interesting. Verse 49 says, And Jesus stood still and commanded to be called. I love that text. He stood still. Boy, isn't it glad when you get the full attention of Jesus Christ? Everybody else is probably begging. The crowds are great. And here he is and he cries, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he didn't quit. He cried a great, uh, a great deal. He wanted to be, the, he wanted to be noticed. He needed to be seen. He knew his life was going nowhere. He knew he'd been on this highway side begging and begging and begging with no fruition. And he's going down a dead end road. But he realizes and understands. I don't know that if, if he had not heard uh, uh, whatever the first trip Jesus made through and how Zacchaeus, this rich man, had encountered him. Uh, maybe he, he heard other stories about what Jesus was doing. Evidently he, he had. But now he realizes maybe this is his last opportunity. And by the way, it probably is because Jesus is headed to Calvary to die for the sins of the world. But thank God, Jesus takes time out for those who are willing to call on Him and approach Him. And He stood still and He commanded Him to be called. Notice verse 49, And they called the blind man and said, he said they said, Be of good comfort. They said, Hey, this is your day, bud. He's heard you. He recognized you. Be of good comfort. Rise, He calleth thee. Well, evidently He has the ability to get up. He has the ability to walk. He's not lame. He's just a beggar. Don't know all the reasons of why he's here. But he has the ability. He rises. He, he says, get up. And notice verse 50. And he cast in away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. You see, as we see the command of the master, first of all, in verse 49 and verse 50, we see Jesus' call. Notice in verse 50, though, something interesting here. And he... Casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. This man had to remove anything hindering him from getting to Jesus. 
Notice, it, you know, the end that they wore the garments that were long. Uh, and many times they tucked them between their legs, whatever. Uh, but it says in this scripture that he cast away his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. He took off those outer robes, anything that would, he would trip over, anything that would hinder him to get into the master, anything that would tie him down. It reminds us that there's some things that we too will have to abandon if we come to Christ. There's some things that we'll have to abandon if we do the will of God. There's some things that we'll have to abandon, forsake and get rid of and, and that are causing us to stumble uh, to keep us from coming to a true relationship and fellowship and service of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the, Jesus call, but then we see his cure. Thank God, verse 51 and verse 52. The Bible says, And Jesus said to him, look, look at his question. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? You think Jesus didn't already know? He already knew. He just wanted to see if he'd be a willing. So remember, he's sovereign. He just wanted to be, see if he'd be honest and open, receptive enough to, to admit his problem. Jesus cured. You see, grace is the hand that extends salvation to us. Faith is the hand that reaches out to receive it. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For a grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Look what Jesus said. The blind man said unto him in verse 51, After Jesus asked him what he would do unto thee, he said that I might receive my sight. That I might receive my sight. You see, his greatest problem wasn't whatever handicap he had. Physically, his greatest handicap was spiritually, and he recognized that. Look what Jesus said to him. He said, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. That little phrase, made thee whole, he said, thy faith hath saved thee. Thy faith hath saved thee. And notice the scripture. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Immediately. Immediately he received his sight. You see, when God does something, he does it right. And you see, you don't have when you get when you when you have experience, experience with Jesus Christ, you don't have to wait later on to discover whether it's real or not. It happens right then. Salvation is an experience that's real. Uh, listen, when God shows mercy and extends grace to you and you receive him as Savior, it's not something you have to wait till you get to the end of your life to see if you've experienced or not enough that you can make it in. Folks, you get it then. You get it right then and it never leaves you. He never leaves you, forsakes you. The Holy Spirit indwells you. And immediately he received his sight and notice what he did. He followed Jesus in the way. Folks, those who say they've received their spiritual sight and they have no inclination or desire to follow Jesus, I'm sorry to say, but there's something wrong in the spiritual parts of their life. Bottom line. Well, let me come to a conclusion tonight. A medical missionary performed surgery on a poor blind man and restored his sight. The man seemed to mysteriously disappear from the village. A couple weeks later, he returned to the missionary's office and when he opened the door, let him in. The man was holding a rope. And on the other end of the rope were 10 blind people that he was bringing to the clinic. <laughs> you know, that goes to show us who our, our, our responsibility is. You see, there are spiritual beggars everywhere we go on this highway of life. Will we hear their cry? Will we see their lostness? Will we extend the rope of hope of Jesus Christ to them? And let them see that there's something better in life. When we let them see that we've experienced the mercy and the grace and goodness of God and live in the overflow so that that mercy and grace and goodness will overflow to them and lead them off. Listen, lead them off of this uh, highway life of begging to a place of a relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Powerful story. You see, I'm glad that Jesus has time for me. I'm glad he has time for you. And I'm glad tonight that, listen, when I called on him, he showed, he showed mercy on me. And he showed mercy on you. And because of that, you're experiencing his grace today. And we can live excited. We can live encouraged. And we can live enthusiastic about what Jesus has done in and through our lives. Because every one of us are pictured uh, in this blind Bartimaeus sitting on the highway side begging. That's who we were without Christ. Lost with doom and gloom going nowhere. But thank God Jesus passed by, amen? And we cried, and we cried, and we, we plead for his mercy and grace, and he heard us. And now he's placed us in the family of God. He's healed us spiritually, and he's working in and through our lives. Why in the world? Why would we want, not want to share that 
with all those tonight that we know that are on the highway side begging. I've got them around me. I'll just give you an illustration of my neighborhood. I wish I knew how to reach them more effectively. I've been praying about some things to do. Excuse me, where's one, one neighbor, I apologize, that profess to know Christ and go to church uh, beside us out of those seven or eight. Uh, other than that, none of them do. But needless to say, folks, in your neighborhood, in your family, everywhere you go, there's folks just like Bartimaeus that just need somebody to stop and pay them some attention and let them know that there's a God that loves them. Amen? Appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, look out for those highway beggars and share Jesus with them when you have the opportunity. Hope you have a great week. Anybody got a closing word on your heart before we, before we close tonight? Anybody just want to brag on the Lord? Anybody? Uh, again, jot these things down on your calendar, these announcements that we've added, the revival, and uh, the couple's not out, and I'll say more about that as time goes on. So let's close in a word of prayer tonight. Now, Chris, you close us if you will, brother.